Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Joanne Witt? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. Joanne Marie Witt was born in 1962 and lived in El Dorado Hills, California. This is an upscale suburb of Sacramento. Joanne came from a wealthy family. Her father owned a successful business. She was exceptionally intelligent. After earning her bachelor's degree, Joanne earned a master's degree in metallurgy. She worked as an engineer for IBM before finding a job with the El Dorado County Department of Transportation. Joanne suffered from lupus. She took quite a bit of medication, including painkillers. She also consumed alcohol frequently. She suffered from extreme fatigue and was concerned about premature death. On November 18, 1994, Joanne had a daughter named Tyler Marie Witt. She raised her as a single mother. The relationship between the mother and daughter was tumultuous. There was a lot of tension, and they frequently argued. After striking Tyler, Joanne lost custody of her for six months. Over time, the relationship between Joanne and Tyler became even more strained. Despite these problems, Joanne tried to provide Tyler with the finer things in life. They lived in a five-bedroom house with a pool in the backyard. Tyler had her own computer, television, cell phone, guitar, and violin. She took horseback riding and music lessons. Joanne and her daughter went on vacations to Hawaii, Chicago, Washington, D.C., Jamaica, and Mexico. In January 2009, when Tyler was 14 years old, she met a 19-year-old man named Stephen Paul Culver. They first encountered each other at the Habit Coffee Shop in El Dorado Hills. Stephen used the nickname Boston. Apparently, he did this because he once had a speech impediment and his classmates falsely believed it sounded like a Boston accent. Stephen worked at a Mexican restaurant and took college classes. Despite the age difference between Stephen and Tyler, they had sex starting in February 2009. In order to discourage her mother, Joanne, from interfering with the relationship, Tyler told her that Stephen was gay and he was like a brother to her. Eventually, Tyler took her effort to be close to Stephen one step further. She asked her mother to let Stephen move into their house. Joanne was not a fan of this idea, and her family told her not to do it. However, Stephen was willing to pay $500 a month, and Joanne did not view him as a threat. In a catastrophically ill-advised move that any reasonable person would have avoided, Joanne let Stephen move into her house in April 2009. For a while, Joanne was quite pleased with the arrangement. She described Stephen as a perfect housemate. He would regularly complete chores, and make Joanne's life easier. Joanne did not realize that Stephen was bad news. He and Tyler took advantage of their newfound freedom by continuing to have sex. They also started using cocaine, marijuana, and ecstasy. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On May 14, 2009, Joanne returned home and went to Tyler's room, but she wasn't there. She knocked on the door to Stephen's room and heard shuffling inside, when Stephen opened the door, Joanne asked for Tyler. Stephen claimed that he did not know where she was. Joanne observed a closet door that was ajar. When she opened the door, she found her daughter in there. Tyler had a noticeable absence of clothing. Joanne assumed that she had interrupted the couple having sex. She was furious and kicked Stephen out of the house. Joanne told him that if he ever returned, she would contact the police. Unfortunately, the young couple was not about to give up their relationship. Stephen covertly entered Joanne's house on about 20 different occasions. Joanne didn't know about this at first, but became suspicious over time. She finally decided to call the police and report Stephen after an incident where Tyler did not answer her cell phone. Investigators spoke to Tyler, but she denied everything. She said that she was in the closet without clothing because she was changing. Nothing was going on. Stephen also denied having sex. The police did not have sufficient evidence of a crime 
and were unable to make an arrest. On June 10, 2009, Joanne found Tyler's journal, which contained entries confirming her suspicions. One referenced sex on a couch. Joanne knew that she had located a key piece of evidence against Stephen, and she once again contacted the police. She had the police talk to Tyler one more time, hoping that Tyler would confess. When her daughter did not confess, Joanne turned over the diary to investigators. She took Tyler out to dinner that night and told her that Stephen was in real trouble. On the night of Thursday, June 11, 2009, Stephen and Tyler murdered 47-year-old Joanne Witt. It's not clear exactly what happened, but Joanne was stabbed 20 times in the master bedroom of her house. That same night, Stephen and Tyler met with a friend of theirs named Matthew Widman. They told Matthew that they had just murdered Joanne. Stephen even showed Matthew a bloody knife. When Joanne missed work on Friday, June 12, her employer became concerned. Her supervisor called the police for a welfare check when Joanne missed work again on Monday, June 15. The police found Joanne's body in the master bedroom of her house. This was the only bedroom that was disturbed. They noticed that no one else was in the house. They became worried about Tyler. They believed that Stephen may have taken her. Stephen was the obvious suspect. The police started looking for him immediately. His vehicle was found on Tuesday, June 16, in a San Francisco impound lot. In his vehicle, the police discovered a journal that contained entries from Stephen. One entry indicated that Joanne was the problem in his life. She was his demise. In another entry, Stephen referred to Tyler as a goddess and wrote, quote, I love you more than you could possibly imagine, unquote. Stephen proclaimed that he would gladly endure any form of punishment, including eternal damnation, in order to have the privilege to stay by Taylor's side. Using credit card information, the police found a hotel room in San Francisco that the couple had rented. By the time they arrived, the couple was gone. Investigators discovered that the room was a mess. It contained cocaine, marijuana, ecstasy, rat poison, and vomit. There was also a note left behind indicating that the couple intended on going someplace with a beautiful view in order to bring a conclusion to their lives. The couple didn't get very far. They were arrested that same day, June 16, after being spotted behind a dumpster in a San Bruno strip mall. It must have been one of those dumpsters with a breathtaking panorama, like a scenic vista dumpster. The police interviewed the young couple. Tyler said that they had tried to run away. She never mentioned a murder. After the police told her they were arresting her for murder, Tyler said, Who did I murder? She then started crying without tears and saying things like, she can't be dead. The interview ended after Tyler asked for an attorney. Stephen also asked for an attorney. The only thing he said to the police prior to this was that he was worried about Tyler. Stephen and Tyler were charged with murder. Initially, it seemed like they were both going to proclaim their innocence to the end. But in August 2010, Tyler indicated she wanted a deal. Her eternal commitment of love to Stephen lost some of its appeal. Tyler admitted to planning the murder, but claimed that Stephen was the actual killer. He's the one who stabbed Joanne. In September 2010, Tyler Witt pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. She would later be sentenced to 15 years in prison. Stephen's trial started in May 2011. As expected, Tyler testified against Stephen. She claimed that they planned on killing her mother together, and they both had knives in their hands, but at the last moment, She couldn't handle it. Only Stephen stabbed her mother. Stephen testified in his own defense. He said that Tyler had called him over to Joanne's house because she was frustrated and angry with her mother. When he arrived, he saw Tyler holding a kitchen knife and there was a red stain on her leg. Tyler said, quote, Boston, I did it. I finally did it. My mom is gone forever, unquote. Stephen went into the master bedroom and found Joanne's body. He said that he falsely confessed to his friend, Matthew. On June 15, 2011, two years to the day after Joanne Witt's body was discovered, Stephen Culver was found guilty of first-degree murder. He received a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. 
Tyler Witt was released from prison in the spring of 2023. Now moving to my analysis. Stephen Culver, otherwise known as Boston, still maintains his innocence. Some people believe he was an accessory to the murder, but did not actually participate in the murder. Tyler was both the mastermind and the killer. This brings me to the question, did Stephen murder Joanne Witt? Let's take a look at the evidence, both for and against the idea that Stephen Culver was guilty of murder, starting with the inculpatory factors. Tyler implicated Stephen and said he was the killer. Stephen confessed to a friend and showed him a bloody knife. Stephen had a motive to kill Joanne. She had turned him into the police for having sex with Tyler. Joanne had a small amount of DNA under her fingernails. It was from a male, but there was not enough to identify the donor. The behavior of Stephen and Tyler after the murder is consistent with guilt. Why did they flee if they were innocent? Moving to the exculpatory factors, the DNA under Joanne's fingernails could have been from any number of men with whom she had contact. Stephen said that he falsely confessed to his friend. He thought that he might as well take the blame because he and Tyler planned on dying anyway. This is supported by the fact that Stephen told Matthew he stabbed Joanne in the stomach, but she had not been stabbed in the stomach. Prior to meeting Stephen, Tyler had threatened her mother with a knife on one occasion and had fantasies about killing her. One entry from Tyler's journal, which referred to Joanne, read, quote, I wish you would die somehow, some way, and leave me the blank alone, unquote. Another entry read, quote, my mom is driving me insane. I can't stand her company for more than five minutes. I hate her, unquote. Tyler fantasized about her mother dying in a motor vehicle collision, asked a friend about obtaining arsenic, and told a friend that if her mother did not let her continue to see Stephen, she would kill her. Tyler admitted that she was a pathological liar and was caught lying on the stand. She admitted that she was the mastermind behind the murder. She said her mother needed to die. Despite claiming that she did not have the nerve to follow through with the actual stabbing, Tyler cleaned up the crime scene. When considering all the evidence, do I think that Stephen was guilty of murder? Yes, I believe he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. What do I think happened in this case? This is just a theory, my opinion. Joanne had a contentious relationship with her daughter and did not supervise her very well. Tyler became self-centered, manipulative, arrogant, grandiose, impulsive, irresponsible, and full of rage. She developed a series of unusual beliefs, including that she had dissociative identity disorder. She insisted that she represented three souls in one body, apparently each of them without a brain. One soul was her true self, the second was a demon named Toby, and the third was an angel named Alex. Over time, Tyler grew to hate her mother with a ferocious intensity. The mother and daughter were in a constant competition. They were always trying to prove who was more intelligent. People who watched them interact could see Tyler's contempt, but they hoped that it was just a phase. When Tyler met Stephen, she believed he was someone who could save her from her evil mother. In one journal entry referring to Stephen, Tyler wrote, quote, I die without him there to hold me, to love me, and protect me, unquote. Stephen was an antisocial and bizarre young man. He was heavily invested into the goth lifestyle and had a collection of edged weapons. Stephen knew that his relationship with Tyler was illegal, but he became obsessed with her. The young couple was not going to let anything interfere with their relationship. Tyler orchestrated the murder, and Stephen stabbed Joanne. The murder was fueled by immaturity, sadism, vindictiveness, narcissism, feelings of passion, and a desire for immediate gratification. Both Stephen and Tyler deserved a long sentence, but Tyler managed to escape justice. At Tyler's sentencing, the judge said there was no evidence that she was remorseful, yet he still gave her just 15 years to life. Considering that Tyler lied on the stand during Stephen's trial, I think that 25 years to life would have been a more reasonable sentence. Now moving to my final thoughts. As I mentioned, Stephen selected Boston to be his nickname. Boston had more than a feeling that he would end up in prison, but his motto should be, don't look back. He may never get peace of mind, but he can be certain when saying to himself, a man I'll never be. Those are my thoughts in the case of Joanne Witt. 
Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.